every area besieged by the regime to be uh, visited with humanitarian supplies every month. Uh, instead of that, in the last three months, a grand total of just two areas besieged by the regime have received any sort of humanitarian access. Uh, that is the sort of uh, issue which we need to address today. Uh, and to increase uh, the pressure on the Syrian regime, a group of uh, countries who are on the humanitarian task force in Geneva uh, have written to the Security Council to express their concern, our concern, about this lack of humanitarian access. Uh, and so we'll be shining a spotlight on that issue today. We're not asking for humanitarian access as a favour. We're asking for it because it's a legal and moral obligation. It's an obligation uh, under successive Security Council resolutions. Talking of, uh, talking of legal obligations uh, that have been flouted and ignored by the Syrian regime, there's a report out uh, from uh, lawyers and doctors for human rights which sets out uh, the uh, systemic abuse and torture and sexual violence uh, committed against prisoners uh, in some of Syria's prisons, and I urge everyone to read that report and the blog uh, which I've just published about it. Realistically, how do you hold Syria accountable if the aid is not getting in? The first thing we need to do is to shine a spotlight on the issue, and that's what we'll be doing today. Secondly, we need to make sure that everyone around the Security Council table with influence over the Assad regime, and we all know who that is, uh, uses that influence to make sure that there is this access. They say, the Russians and others say, that they agree that there should be humanitarian access. But we look at the facts, we look at the figures, and we see that the areas that are besieged by the regime are not getting anything like the humanitarian access needed to keep people alive. Have you received any comments from the regime about well, what they normally do is come up with some sort of excuse. They usually blame the opposition, they blame the terrorists, uh, and, they, uh, and they, 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 they try to deflect attention from their own responsibility. But we know, and you know, that the primary responsibility for protecting civilians in a country lies with the authorities of that country, uh, and the Syrian regime are the ones who are besieging the areas that we are talking about. And what are the cities and towns that are now top priority? So we are concerned about all of those. We'll be hearing uh, an update from, uh, from, from the UN, from, uh, from Humanitarian Affairs, uh, imminently on that. Okay, thank you, Ron. Yes, sure. What do you make of the President of Cyprus? The comments recently about Espen Barth Ida, they're saying they're going to release the notes from Crans Montana. Do you think that the process, where does it stand as, as panholder? We look forward to the, I hope, unanimous adoption of the resolution uh, renewing the mandate for the UN peacekeeping force in Cyprus uh, and looking ahead uh, through a review to, it, to its longer term future. Uh, we are very disappointed that the Crans Montana talks did not lead to a success despite the huge effort that everyone, including the UN Secretary General personally, uh, put in. Uh, we've called for a, a time for reflection, a pause. Uh, and we encourage the parties not to get into any sort of blame game, and I'm not going to get into a blame game myself either. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.